Another grievous form of lack of self-control is the spending habit. I have reference, of course, to the habit of spending beyond one's needs. This habit has become so prevalent since the close of the World War that it is alarming. A well-known economist has prophesied that three more generations will transform the United States from the richest country in the world to the poorest if the children are not taught the savings habit as a part of their training in both the schools and the homes. On every hand, we see people buying automobiles on the installment plan instead of buying homes. Within the last 15 years, the automobile fad has become so popular that literally tens of thousands of people are mortgaging their futures to own cars. A prominent scientist who has a keen sense of humor has prophesied that not only will this habit grow lean bank accounts, but it persisted in, it will eventually grow babies whose legs will have become transformed into wheels. This is a speed-mad money-spending age in which we are living, and the uppermost thought in the minds of most of us is to live faster than our neighbors. Not long ago, the general manager of a concern that employs 600 men and women became alarmed over the large number of his employees who were becoming involved with loan sharks and decided to put an end to this evil. When he completed his investigation, he found that only 9% of his employees had savings accounts, and of the other 91% who had no money ahead, 75% were in debt in one form or another, some of them being hopelessly involved financially. Of those who were in debt, 210 owned automobiles. We are creatures of imitation. We find it hard to resist the temptation to do that which we see others doing. If our neighbor buys a Buick, we must imitate him, and if we cannot scrape together enough to make the first payment on a Buick, we must at least have a Ford. Meanwhile, we take no heed of the morrow. The old-fashioned rainy-day nest egg has become obsolete. We live from day to day. We buy our coal by the pound and our flour in five-pound sacks, thereby paying a third more for it than it ought to cost, because it is distributed in small quantities. Of course, this warning does not apply to you. It is intended only for those who are binding themselves in the chains of poverty by spending beyond their earning capacity, and who have not yet heard that there are definite laws which must be observed by all who would attain success. The automobile is one of the modern wonders of the world, but it is more often a luxury than it is a necessity, and tens of thousands of people who are now stepping on the gas at a lively pace are going to see some dangerous skidding when their rainy days arrive. It requires considerable self-control to use the streetcars as a means of transportation when people all around us are driving automobiles, but all who exercise this self-control are practically sure to see the day when many who are now driving cars will be either riding the streetcars or walking. It was this modern tendency to spend the entire income which prompted Henry Ford to safeguard his employees with certain restrictions when he established his famous five-dollar-a-day minimum wage scale. Twenty years ago, if a boy wanted a wagon, he fashioned the wheels out of boards and had the pleasure of building it himself. Now, if a boy wants a wagon, he cries for it and gets it. Lack of self-control is being developed in the oncoming generations by their parents who have become victims of the spending habit. Three generations ago, practically any boy could mend his own shoes with the family cobbling outfit. Today, the boy takes his shoes to the corner shoe shop and pays $1.75 for heels and half-soles, and this habit is by no means confined to the rich and well-to-do classes. I repeat, the spending habit is turning America into a nation of paupers. I am safe in assuming that you are struggling to attain success, for if you were not, you would not be reading this course. Let me remind you, then, that a little savings account will attract many an opportunity to you that would not come your way without it. The size of the account is not so important as is the fact that you have established the savings habit. For this habit marks you as a person who exercises an important form of self-control. The modern tendency of those who work for a salary is to spend it all. If a man who receives $3,000 a year and manages to get along on it fairly well receives an increase of $1,000 a year, does he continue to live on $3,000 and place the increased portion of his income in the savings bank? No, not unless he is one of the few who have developed the savings habit. Then what does he do with his additional thousand dollars? He trades in the old automobile and buys a more expensive one, 
and at the end of the year he is poorer on a $4,000 income than he was the previous year on a $3,000 income. This is a modern 20th century model American that I am describing, and you will be lucky if, upon close analysis, you do not find yourself to be one of this class. Somewhere between the miser who hoards every penny he gets his hands on in an old sock and the man who spends every cent he can earn or borrow, there is a happy medium. And if you enjoy life with reasonable assurance of average freedom and contentment, you must find this halfway point and adopt it as a part of your self-control program. Self-discipline is the most essential factor in the development of personal power because it enables you to control your appetite and your tendency to spend more than you earn and your habit of striking back at those who offend you and the other destructive habits which cause you to dissipate your energies through non-productive effort that takes on forms too numerous to be catalogued in this lesson. Very early in my public career, I was shocked when I learned how many people there are who devote most of their energies to tearing down that which the builders construct. By some queer turn of the wheel of fate, one of these destroyers crossed my path by making it his business to try to destroy my reputation. At first I was inclined to strike back at him, but as I sat at my typewriter late one night, a thought came to me which changed my entire attitude toward this man. Removing the sheet of paper that was in my typewriter, I inserted another one on which I stated this thought in these words. You have a tremendous advantage over the man who does you an injury. You have it within your power to forgive him, while he has no such advantage over you. As I finished writing those lines, I made up my mind that I had come to the point at which I had to decide upon a policy that would serve as a guide concerning my attitude toward those who criticize my work or try to destroy my reputation. I reached this decision by reasoning something after this fashion. Two courses of action were open to me. I could waste much of my time and energy in striking back at those who would try to destroy me, or I could devote this energy to furthering my life work and let the result of that work serve as my sole answer to all who would criticize my efforts or question my motives. I decided upon the latter as being the better policy and adopted it. By their deeds you shall know them. If your deeds are constructive and you are at peace with yourself in your own heart, you will not find it necessary to stop and explain your motives, for they will explain themselves. The world soon forgets its destroyers. It builds its monuments to and bestows its honors upon none but its builders. Keep this fact in mind and you will more easily reconcile yourself to the policy of refusing to waste your energies by striking back at those who offend you. Every person who amounts to anything in this world comes to the point, sooner or later, at which he is forced to settle this question of policy toward his enemies. And if you want proof that it pays to exercise sufficient self-control to refrain from dissipating your vital energies by striking back, then study the records of all who have risen to high stations in life and observe how carefully they curbed this destructive habit. It is a well-known fact that no man ever reached a high station in life without opposition of a violent nature from jealous and envious enemies. The late President Warren G. Harding and ex-President Wilson and John H. Patterson of the National Cash Register Company and scores of others whom I could mention were victims of this cruel tendency of a certain type of depraved man to destroy reputation. But these men wasted no time explaining or striking back at their enemies they exercised self-control. I do not know but that these attacks on men who are in public life, cruel and unjust and untruthful as they often are, serve a good purpose. In my own case, I know that I made a discovery that was of great value to me as a result of a series of bitter attacks which a contemporary journalist launched against me. I paid no attention to these attacks for four or five years until finally they became so bold that I decided to override my policy and strike back at my antagonist. I sat down at my typewriter and began to write. In all of my experience as a writer, I do not believe I ever assembled such a collection of biting adjectives as those which I used on this occasion. The more I wrote, the more angry I became until I had written all that I could think of on the subject. As the last line was finished, a strange feeling came over me. It was not a feeling of bitterness toward the man who tried to injure me. 
It was a feeling of compassion, of sympathy, of forgiveness. I had unconsciously psychoanalyzed myself by releasing over the keys of my typewriter the repressed emotions of hate and resentment which I had been unintentionally gathering in my subconscious mind over a long period of years. Now, if I find myself becoming very angry, I sit down at my typewriter and write it out of my system, then throw away the manuscript, or file it away as an exhibit for my scrapbook to which I can refer back in the years to come. After the evolutionary processes have carried me still higher in the realm of understanding. Repressed emotions, especially the emotion of hatred, resemble a bomb that has been constructed of high explosives. And unless they are handled with as much understanding of their nature as an expert would handle a bomb, they are as dangerous. A bomb may be rendered harmless by explosion in an open field or by disintegration in a bath of the proper sort. Also, a feeling of anger or hatred may be rendered harmless by giving expression to it in a manner that harmonizes with the principle of psychoanalysis. Before you can achieve success in the higher and broader sense, you must gain such thorough control over yourself that you will be a person of poise. You are the product of at least a million years of evolutionary change. For countless generations preceding you, nature has been tempering and refining the materials that have gone into your makeup. Step by step, she has removed from the generations that have preceded you the animal instincts and baser passions, until she has produced in you the finest specimen of animal that lives. She has endowed you through this slow evolutionary process with reason and poise and balance sufficient to enable you to control and do with yourself whatever you will. No other animal has ever been endowed with such self-control as you possess. You have been endowed with the power to use the most highly organized form of energy known to man, that of thought. It is not improbable that thought is the closest connecting link there is between the material, physical things of this world and the world of divinity. You have not only the power to think, but what is a thousand times more important still, you have the power to control your thoughts and direct them to do your bidding. We are coming now to the really important part of this lesson. Read slowly and meditatively. I approach this part of this lesson almost with fear and trembling, for it brings us face to face with a subject which but few men are qualified to discuss with reasonable intelligence. I repeat, you have the power to control your thoughts and make them do your bidding. Your brain may be likened to a dynamo in this respect, that it generates or sets into motion the mysterious energy called thought. The stimuli that start your brain into action are of two sorts. One is auto-suggestion, and the other is suggestion. You can select the material out of which your thinking is produced, and that is auto-suggestion or self-suggestion. You can permit others to select the material out of which your thinking is produced, and that is suggestion. It is a humiliating fact that most thought is produced by the outside suggestions of others, and it is more humiliating still to have to admit that the majority of us accept this suggestion without either examining it or questioning its soundness. We read the daily papers as though every word were based upon fact. We are swayed by the gossip and idle chatter of others as though every word were true. 